problem and producing something bold and exciting. It therefore comes as a, a bit of a shock to learn that not only was the architect but that he had the Rupert books very much in mind when he designed it. It's because of, the, of this attempt to break out of the normal uh, way of looking at things in, as a, in, to, in a tight package or in a tight approach to actually broaden the spectrum to try and say a place for enjoyment for all of all ages. And I think in a way that's Rupert too. And the fact that you can read Rupert through th these different layers from very quickly headlines to the detail, from uh, short stories to long, um, yet always within a framework which is understandable, that you can play these tunes within a framework which is quite understandable, and something which is pure enjoyment, no cruelty, um, and no attempts to twist. Uh, there's a sort of sim simplicity which I enjoy immensely. Alfred Bestel didn't create Rupert. That honor probably belongs to this lady. Her name's Mary Tortell. She was an artist and, rather surprisingly, an aviatrix. Well, at least she um, went as a passenger in a plane like this, um, flown by her husband, on a record-breaking flight from Hounslow to Brussels in 1919. Well, at about this time, the Daily Mail newspaper was running a children's strip called Teddy Tail. And the Mail's arch-rival, The Express, decided it was about time that they uh, came up with their answer to Teddy Tail. And it just so happened that the night editor of The Express was Mary Tortell's husband. And that's how, on November the 8th, 1920, the first Rupert strip appeared. Mary Tortell wrote and drew Rupert throughout the 1920s in The Daily Express. In 1935, however, her eyesight, which had been failing for some time, finally forced her to retire. And Rupert was handed over to an artist by the name of Alfred Bestel. And as far as I'm concerned, it's then that the magic started. Alfred Bestel was the son of a Methodist missionary. He was born in Mandalay, but he was educated in North Wales. He was, originally, he was destined for the civil service, but he persuaded his father to let him study art, first at Birmingham and then at the London County Council School of Art. Throughout the 20s, his name can be found in uh, many children's books and in uh, many magazines such as The Passing Show and in the pages of Punch. Mother entertaining Christmas visitor. Ah, I hear my little Bobby coming. I do so want you to tell me which side of the family you think he takes after. No, I was, um, I'm fucked the old and I was brought up really on um, Teddy Tail, the Daily Mail and, and the Pipsqueak and Wilfrey, the Daily Mirror. And I, and I didn't really come across Rupert till my children were old enough to be read to. Mm -hmm. Uh, although I knew best all, of course, because I had a passion uh, for uh, the artist who illustrated Punch. Oh, yeah. And I had an uncle who had all the violent volumes of Punch ever since its foundation, which I used to go through every single year and then test myself as to whether I could recognize their style. And Bestall, of course, was one I remember very well. When Alfred Bestall took over Rupert from Mary Tortell, he had to adapt to the style which she'd already created. But he, he brought to it elements which had hitherto been missing. For although Mary Tortell created the distinctive style of illustration, she was also guilty of writing some of the most excruciating verse ever written in the English language. Uh, try this for size. It came a knock at Mrs. Bear's front door. When she opened it, stood there a cobbler. Ma'am, asked he, have you any boots that need repair? No, she replied, I haven't. Oh, said he, I'm sorry, and turned to go. But, said little Rupert, who'd come up, there's Dad's boots, Mum, you know. I'd quite forgotten those, she said. I'll get them in a minute. On his back, the cobbler had a sack. Rupert wondered what was in it. When Alfred Bestel took over, Rupert underwent a sea change. Not only was a new format introduced, but the little bear himself became more assertive and positive. In the Mary Tortell story from which I've just been quoting, Rupert is merely whisked around the countryside by a pair of magic boots that he can't control. At each touchdown, he meets with evil characters who have designs on him and his boots, and before whom he's absolutely helpless. But in each case, before anything nasty can actually happen to him, he's whisked away again by the magic boots. Eventually, however, he's ensnared by the wiles of a robber chief's daughter, 
who takes him to bed, where he's finally reduced to tears, at which the girl is moved to pity and helps him escape. Well, throughout, Rupert is the hapless innocent. But in, in Bestel's hands, a story based on the, the same premise becomes a very different thing. Rupert's role is much more dynamic. Moreover, there's a, a grand finale in which he rescues his friend Barbara, escapes by the skin of his teeth, and finally returns home by means of a spectacular double three-fall parachute jump. At the same time that Alfred Bestel made Rupert's character more assertive and positive, he also made Mary Tortell's illustrative style very much his own. Mary Tortell's Rupert is almost expressionless, and his movements are frequently stiff and awkward. Bestel brought to the figures an easy naturalness of movement um, that shows a mastery of technique. There's almost nothing that he can't make a, a little animal in trousers do uh, and get away with it. He can even make a, a, an elephant dressed as an Edwardian schoolboy turn cartwheels and still somehow make it believable. Bestel also brought Rupert's own expressions to life in a way in which they hadn't been before. I claim now, when people ask me what my major influences were, that, uh, in fact, it's Walt Disney, but, in fact, Rupert's stories precede Disney. Uh, I used to try and copy them. They're very difficult to copy. Uh, Disney's easier to copy. The line is easier. The, the, the lines he uses to express the personality of, of his characters. Rupert is a very subtle little bear. Uh, but if you try and copy the expression in those current eyes, it's, you've got to be an expert to dollop them in and just get them spot on. Artists taking over from Bestel, did they find it actually difficult to draw Rupert's expression? Yes, I know that. I believe Alex Kuby, for example, spent about six months simply drawing Rupert over and over and over again. And even at one point, uh, and again, I'm uh, speaking rather off the top of my head here, um, other artists were drawing the bodies, parts of the background, and Bestel was drawing the heads, the faces, because they were so difficult. And they, they are extraordinarily difficult to draw. How do you rate a Bestel as an artist? I, I, I do. Shepherd. I'd say, yes, he's certainly as good as Shepard, and I'm... Uh, Shepard is no more devoted fan than I have, but I, I think he's every bit as good as Ernest Shepard. He's often better than Shepard. His work is... Shepard can be sloppy. I've never seen Bestel sloppy at all. His work's absolutely meticulous, and his backgrounds are superb. The other thing I've always been struck by is his very strong sense of composition. Because a square, which he works in always, a square is a very difficult thing to, to fill properly. I mean, a horizontal one or a vertical one is a normal artist's uh, proportion. The square, I think, is a very, very difficult um, thing to compose in. He's always seems to find it effortlessly. Every, every picture fills the, fills the frame beautifully. Bestel also brought something else to the Rupert books. He brought an almost cinematic quality. Whereas Mary Tortell would often keep the same shot, as it were, for two or sometimes even three pictures, Bestel is always altering the angle, the point of view. It, it's just as if he was shooting film. Now, to do this means that the places and objects he's drawing have to have a three-dimensional existence. And yet, for the most part, the, the places and objects are fantasy. And the only place they can exist in three dimensions is in Bestel's mind. And it's the, the power of his imagination that allows him to see the things in their totality in his imagination. And then it's his uh, expertise, his mastery of technique, that allows him to just draw them from any angle, from any point of view, straight out onto the page. Here's an example from the 1973 annual. We never see this castle in its entirety, and yet every frame adds to our knowledge of its geography, so that bit by bit it's established as a real place in our minds, just as the camera would reveal an actual castle in a film. But perhaps above all, Bestel brought to the fantasy a, a surrealism that was quite different from anything that had gone before. Mary Tattell's fantasy tends to be the fantasy of the fairy tale or the nursery rhyme. She has ogres and dragons and princesses and fairy tale castles. But Bestel's imagination juxtaposes perfectly ordinary objects in surprising and amazing ways. Or he plays with their natural qualities, almost in the manner of the surrealist painters. The roots of a Christmas tree become its legs and help it run away. A rowing boat is caught in the treetops. 
the treetops themselves become another world that you can walk across. Podgy becomes lighter than air and has to see the doctor. Rupert cycles up a tree, over the clouds and off them. He picks up a fan he can't put down. Trees get huge insect bites or suddenly sprout daffodils and snowmen fly majestically through the night sky. If you draw with authority, uh, you can make people believe anything. Uh, they sometimes, you know, for instance, the lesser surrealist artists, you think, what a stupid picture. But the very best, if you look at a very good Salvador Dali, you never question for one minute that, you know, watches don't melt over the sides of mountains and mantelpieces. You simply accept the artist's reality. It's one of the skills. A good artist can actually convince you that his reality is yours. In the same way here, the Rupert in the treetops, this world inhabited by enormous birds and a king with a kind of you know, ermine cloak and a crown, you simply accept it. It's, it's the artist's reality which he convinces you it's there. Darley would have loved Rupert, he really would. Here's one that combines uh, some wonderfully surreal images with his tale-telling te technique at its best. It's called Rupert in Mysteryland. Rupert is inviting his friends to his birthday party, but he can't think how to entertain them. Why not ask the conjurer to show you some conjuring tricks, suggests Pong Ping. The conjurer is away, but his son says he can teach him a few tricks. Rupert and Pong Ping start for home, but on the way they're confronted by a wild dog who is more than interested in their parcels. He's just about to lock them up in a cave when Rupert remembers the conjurer's wand. He waves it desperately, and to his relief and astonishment, the wild dog totally disappears. You are a cool customer, says Pong Ping. The day of the birthday party arrives, and Rupert entertains his friends with the various tricks. Willie Mouse is so excited by the disappearing wand that he persuades Rupert to let him have a go. But something goes wrong. Bill, Edward and Algy cannot be found, and Rupert has to explain to their anxious parents that he doesn't know how to bring them back. Rupert and Willie run back to the conjurers to find out how to reverse the spell, but the conjurer's son says he doesn't know either. Rupert is in despair, when suddenly he has an idea. Before Willie can stop him, he turns the wand on himself. <laughs> 